Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel and Escape from the City on the ABC. And Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of the 2018 Property Investment Advisory Firm of the Year. All right, folks, you're on the Property Couch for each week. Ben and I bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. Welcome back to the couch for the 241st time, Ben. Oh, mate, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> mate, now, I still want you to keep your, I still want you to keep your A-game because just because you've been uh, 241 in a row doesn't mean that there's no sort of yeah, well, I'm tap looking, on the shoulder to I'm, say I'm, that you might miss I'm, out I'm, next week. I can see the 250th. <laughs> I can see that. Right. I can see that coming. We are in the shadows of 250. Yes. And we are in the shadows of 5 million downloads. 5 better. million. So, Wonderful. Which is epic. So we are so, so excited about that. So thank you, folks. Thanks for being a part of our community. Thanks for helping us make sure people make better decisions when it comes to property investing and hopefully setting yourself up for a better financial future as a result. Hey, yeah, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters, Ben, with the footy tips. I just wanted to remind, um, particularly our poor New South Wales and Queensland folks who probably <laughs> don't like AFL yeah, Everyone's much. already skipping through this bit. Before you skip, before you skip, 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 just a reminder that our prizes for the footy tipping, first prize is a property portfolio plan, $4,950 worth yes. of money. Uh, the second prize is a property plan where mm-hmm. we help you plan the next purchase. That's uh, almost 3000 worth of value there. And the third prize is an uh, an hour chat with uh, yourself, myself. Yep. And what that means is the person who wins that sends us in advance the agenda that they want to talk about. We will prepare. And then we'll get on the phone and we'll have a chat to help them with that. So or if they're in Melbourne, we'll, we'll, we'll meet them face to face. Come on in. Absolutely. Or if someone who wins wants yeah, to fly wants down. Wants to fly down. No, come on in. No problem. So, folks, um, just a reminder. So, a um, couple of things. Uh, last week, I, um, Stiggy did not want me to talk about the fact that she had gone down the ladder <laughs> in the footy tips. So I'm not sure if she actually wants me to talk about the fact <laughs> that she's now back in front of me. Um, so, uh, well done, Ivis. Uh, the live ladder, as we speak, Ben, yes. is... Oh, actually, before that, the, the yeah, winner is... it's not about us. <laughs> the, win, the, the win, No, 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 I was going to go with the others. The, the winner is Go Blues. Go Blues. Eight, eight tips with a margin of one. Oh, because obviously they tipped the Blues against Sydney. That was an upset. Yeah, so reach out yeah, for... Well done, Go Blues. Book of your choice, bo- uh, Go Blues. Now, the live ladder is... Uh, leading the competition is Spiro Malakalis, Ben. Spiro. Malakalis. Malakalis. With 98 and a margin Spiro. of 412. Uh, Father of Dragons is second, also a 98, but with a, an inferior margin, margin. Yep. of 453. And then King Kleb, 97. Oof. With a margin of no, sorry, <laughs> yeah. it's King Clam. <laughs> He's and they won ninety seven tips, and uh, not born in ninety seven, and um, a margin of four forty six. So, oh, yeah. mate, there's a bit of tension between yeah, those three. Close there's now, a few as we come to the end. Now, Stiggy, just so you know, she's got 90 tips with a margin of 5.11. she's 87th in the league. Uh, She she is. Thank you for reading my notes. Fifey, uh, the the great Nat Fife, which which is at 89. Because you don't tip Frio. So I'm one less than Ivis. Now, that's the point she wanted me to make sure I... I, sort of emphasise, so there you go. But here's the here's the thing, Ben. Oh, and, and where am I? I'm a margin of 447, Ivis yeah. is 5'11", so I've got to... <laughs> if, well, you've just got to get well, the tips right. Well, i just got to get the tips. And um, Ivis, Ivis doesn't speak very often on our podcast, Ben, no. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to her and see what happens. Gandhi, which is you. Yes. Um, with 84 tips, mm-hmm. with a margin of 520. Well, Ivis, where does that leave Ben in the competition? 184th, she whispered <laughs> to me. Yes, right. 184th, <laughs> mate. mate uh, built, built on good foundations. Oh, my gombies, mate. What? Built on good foundations. But hey, what are let's, you let's doing? Talk, let's quickly talk footy. Great win by the pies. So, so I mean, gutsy, gritty, no, I, over the so, West against the team that has, has had our measure for the last four rounds. Mate, I thought we were trying to say stuff so that our Go New South Wales boys. and Queensland people didn't skip don't, this interest. Don't care. Hey, I listen. Can't, I can't win the, I can't Alistair, win the property sh- portfolio. Sh- sh- Alistair plan. Maxwell, Alistair Maxwell uh, posted this on the Property Catch Timer. This is just how many arrows I have on my back. I'm just showing you, right? <laughs> so he's put Sean, Sean Burgoyne. 370 games played for 247 wins, right? Yeah. Then he's put Fremantle Dockers, 599 games played for 247 wins. <laughs> I don't think that was very nice. That wasn't nice. Anyway, at all. pies are back. Pretty really performance. That's all I care about. As I said, I can't win the I can't win the prize. So I'm going for go pies. 
Yeah, good work, boys. It was what? a gutsy win. More went down, you know. More on the pies later in my uh, life hack. Pandas went saying. down. So, Ben, the Susan Alberti uh, book challenge is now completed, which yes. is good. Yeah, wonderful responses. Now, here's the deal. There was a number of people who wrote what impact they actually had. Mm. Uh, uh, what Susan had on had them. on them. Yes. So, what we were doing is we were going to pick a couple so they can win a book, right? But given that all proceeds go to her charity if we Ooh. buy the book. We decided yep. that every single person who made a comment, so don't worry about putting any more comments now because we've we're yep. close to five. Close it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't put comments, but just so you know. Um, we, we've gone and the Property Couch has gone and bought the books so that Susan um, gets some money to the charity and yep. you can all have one. So Terrific. Oh, there we all heard from Ivers. She started, the, she started the clap, so there you go. All right, so well done, folks. Um, we, we have been inundated with amazing feedback um, from Susan Alberti. So if you have not listened to that episode, go back a couple of episodes and listen to that. All right, upcoming. Uh, we, you and I just put a video together yesterday, the mm-hmm. five things you must know before, and not after, not during. Yes. Before buying an investment property, these five things, and I can assure you it's not the layups, it's not get your finance ready. Yep. Um, these are hard hitting. Be pre approved before you go. Yep. yep, which yep. they're all true, right? But they've yes. all been written about a million times before. We came yep. up with five unique things yes. that you must know before buying an investment property, and you need to watch that if you're contemplating buying an investment property. So the link will be in the show notes. In the show notes so here. So click on that. Wherever you're getting your podcast from. Check that out, free here. content. And if you stay around to the end of that um, video, Ben, there's a little help that we might have something coming up um, next week that might be of interest to those people. So there you go. Now, Ben, we are totally upping our Facebook Live game. We are, are we? Do- Woohoo! So we get some really great questions from our uh, audience. Yep. And we're going to answer them as best we can either on this show during Q&As yes. or we're going to do it on Facebook Lives. Facebook Lives. So many questions. So what you need to do is you need to be a part of our community. So again, there'll be a link in the show notes. One click if you're running, if you're on the train, if you're doing something now that is anything other than driving where you're going to have 100% focus, Ben. <laughs> if you have any other thing that you're doing, just scroll down, pick the show notes, click on that link and just become a part of our Facebook community because there is so, we're going to give so much free content out between now and the end of the mm-hmm. year, Ben. Um, you'd be mad not to be um, part of that. So if you do that, uh, you will see all of this content that we're doing. Now, for those of you that are time poor or you're driving at the moment and you just cannot get to the show notes, Ben, what I would say to you is go to thepropertycouch.com.au, go to our homepage. On the front page there, you can uh, register for a free copy of the Money Smarts book, mm-hmm. uh, a free copy of the chapter of the Money Smarts book. Freudian slip because we're trying to get a free copy in everyone's hands shortly, yes. so more on that soon. Yep. But if you go and give us your email address there, mm-hmm. we do a monthly wrap email where we send you every single piece of content we've done. The, the podcast, the videos, the interviews, the giveaways, the books, everything that we did in a month. That's for me. That's, that's And I think we should have the title of that, Hey Time Poor, hey, time poor Folk. Yeah, because that's the one I'd go to. <laughs> yeah, you, that, that is the one that you would go to. So, so you've built that for me, so I appreciate that. So, folks, there's we, we are trying to get as much free content into your hands All as we can in one monthly email. Yeah. Oh, I like it. You do like that. So there you go, folks. So make sure you're part of that. And the last thing, Ben, um, just Before a very I have something to announce. Unplanned. Oh, um, you, you unplanned. Keep going. Keep wow. going. I like to keep you going. Okay, it's fair it's enough. Both. Ivis is panicking. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're just used to you coming, putting the gloves the on, being like, a genius self, walking went, out. Yes. There's this yeah. stillness, but anyway, we'll yeah. move on. Yeah, well, I'm, I've got some anxiety building, don't worry <laughs> about that. Uh, just a little note that, uh, that we saw an opportunity with the Sydney market sort of coming back. Yeah. That there may be an opportunity where some people, because it's such an expensive market, some people might want to buy a future family home, Ben, yep. but make it an investment property at the moment. So an amazing time to upgrade or make an investment property purchase. Yeah, so mm-hmm. we, we have now got a buyer's agent in our Sydney office. We do. Don't, I don't often talk about our business, just a very slight, um, slight tangent here. So um, just letting anyone know if they think that, hey, look, I, I might move into my family home in two or three or four years' time, mm-hmm. but I think I might like to lock in the prices that we're experiencing right now, um, let us know. We might be able to help you out. But we do have uh, Nicole in our Sydney office as a Sydney buyer's agent there. So now, mate. Well, mine, look, it's just a little teaser, just yeah. a little teaser that there is going to be a substantial upgrade to the Money Smarts platform. Oh, 
So it's going to happen. It's going to happen in August. Oh, I was All just right. so Ooh, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> just like, thinking, oh. what report did I have to put together? That's no reports, no yeah. links in the show yeah. notes. Just it's coming in August. So and it's big. It's big. So so just to you know, just for those people who are using the panel, we've got over a thousand people in our community on Facebook. There, some great people helping each other. There's lots of great tips around credit cards and how to structure your finance. So it's all good stuff. So that is going to be in conjunction with what you were mentioning before about our little giveaway, which um, so all all big big month August, big shape yeah, up to be a big you, month it is. for money. You big month for money. You, you, you want to make sure that we know who you are so we can let you know. So maybe I was one last reference get. to the show notes. I think that's what it should be called, all get, not all guest, just all get. Because hey, we're come? just going to give you everything. That's brilliant. It's where all get. From? Let's <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had all guests before. We have had all guests before. Like we're going for all get. All right. We're just going to give is it away. Is that because you misspelt it or is that a <laughs> <laughs> So there you go, obviously in the show notes, link to the Make Money Simple Again Facebook page. Yes. Come and be a part of that community, yep. um, which would be terrific. So, all right, my Mindset Minute theme today, man. So here's the start of the show. <laughs> <laughs> here's the start of the show. 10 minutes in, we're into the start of the show. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the Queensland and New South Wales people who skipped the first bit. Um, all right, so this is from Stuart Wright. Stuart. Um, who, who gets a who gets a book for writing in? Lovely. A hey, long time listener, first time writer. I absolutely love the work that you both do, and wanted to share a quote which has served me well recently. Mm-hmm. The ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term, in order to enjoy greater rewards in the long term, is the indispensable prerequisite for success. That was Brian Tracy. Now, Ben, the reason I thought that was a very good spot to put here is because, as you very well know. We had Susan Alberti in, Mm -hmm. and that would probably be the number one takeaway Mm. amongst a thousand takeaways that she offered. Make sure you delay. Sacrifice before success. Gratification. Mm. Also, we have an upcoming episode next week where we're interviewing a very, very switched on young lady. Doing it. Who also knows the value of delayed gratification. So folks, I wanted to really put that into your psyche that the ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term in order to enjoy greater rewards in the long term is the indispensable prerequisite for success, as said by Brian Tracy. Beautiful. Love it. Thank yep. you, Stuart. Now, Ben, straight yes. to straight to the show. We yep. uh, we recently interviewed special a guest. very good friend. Oh, special guest. V- very special guest, Peter Kulizos. Can yep. you say his surname? Kulizos. Is that because I just said it? Or Pete, the property professor. Pete, the property professor. <laughs> as I like to refer to I him. I like to refer to him as the Prince of Adelaide. But uh, we had him come into the studio, Ben, mm-hmm. and uh, give us the 12 steps to a profitable... You're not going to heckle me? <laughs> You're just going to leave that alone? Was he cool? Now, I'm, what was that? <laughs> Give another go. 12 steps to a profitable property development with Peter Kaluzos. Let's Say cut that within three seconds. 12 steps to a profitable property development with Peter Kaluzos. Oh, Kaluzos. beautiful. Let's cut to our interview right now. All right, we've got a very special guest today, Peter Kaluzos. I always call him the Prince of Adelaide, Ben, but most people know him as the property professor. Welcome back to the Property Couch, Pete. Thank you very much, Bryce. Pleasure to be here. Hey, um, we knew that you were in town and uh, we've had you on the couch before. A so, couple of times, um, yes. And very, very uh, gentrification, your backstory. So if you haven't uh, heard those, gearing. C- circle back. Mm-hmm. And um, That was a big one, wasn't it, That ben? was a big one. Well, we should we should actually start with that, Ben. What's it like? You know, you are the, uh, the, the, the current chair of the Property Investment Professionals mm-hmm. of Australia talking to the former chair. And uh, it was a big agenda that uh, both of you played in the election. Is, is it nice to know that uh, oh. you've got a three-year break? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one, Labor Party's not coming back with that. Surely. You what, third like time lucky? I don't think so, Is that so, the mate. official line from you? <laughs> <laughs> but, but one thing is for sure, given that you do have the current chair of Picker and the current chair of Pippa um, here, is that... They, they, we can't rest on our laurels, right? The point being is, and this is why we want all property investors to join Picker and all tradespeople in the game to join Pippa, is because they are going to come after higher net worth people to raise tax revenues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, whether it's off the back of, um, you know, sort of negative gearing or a capital gains tax, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that they're not done here mm. in regards to whether it's land tax, stamp duties, the whole lot, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, with a stronger voice and more members, 
we will be able to influence that conversation. As much as we played a small little role, we, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people have reached out to you, Pete, I'm sure, and said thank you for the contribution you made, as they have done to me. But I think it is a poignant point to talk about the fact that, you know, if we can get our association size up to 50,000, 100,000 people of the two plus million people who are property investors, mm-hmm. They, will, voice. they mm. will get us to the table, and yeah. that's all we want. We just yeah. want to sit there. We want a seat at the table as well. People yeah. want a seat at the table. Correct. To uh, Number one for legislation in uh, property investment advice. Yes. But we've also got some other ideas, how we can help with housing affordability, you know, get more people to own their own house, make rental more affordable. But number one is we want legislation in the property investment advice field. Yeah, so don't shut us out. Yeah. Let us come along yeah. to the table, and we'll get the balance right. Mm. right? Start to speak to the industry experts and the people who it's going to affect the yeah. most so if you haven't already joined pick at five dollars or twenty dollars for five years we're coming up to we're over two and a half thousand members mm-hmm. so we're on our way to five thousand members it's it, i know it takes 10 minutes to mm-hmm. become a member but seriously if we get those numbers earlier rather than the scramble that we have to do when something is about mm-hmm. to change and we're also seeing the legislation change around um, landlords and tenants We've got work to do in those spaces mm. on a state-by-state basis. So the more people who get involved and give us a number, because that's what we're talking about here, the better it is for all of us. Mm. So True. if they want to reach out, it's uh, picard.asn.au. And pippa.asn.au. Okay, okay very easy. Non-for-profit to associations. Mm-hmm. Very simple. Pippa and Picker. Now, uh, very well said, gents. Now, the reason that we got you here, Pete, is uh, in the past we've talked about gentrification. As I said before, we've talked about your portfolio. We've talked about investing in Adelaide. But one thing that we haven't necessarily drilled in on your skill set is in the area of property development, which we're going to talk about today on our episode. But before we do, can you just remind us of the backstory and how you initially entered into the property development game prior, prior to teaching other people? Yep. Uh, so we started off investing in property like many people do and then we we're looking for quicker returns so we started renovating property and then f- uh, we had four ki- we got four kids so as the more kids came along it, it was more difficult to find time to renovate property and then I discovered that you could make money just by dealing with the land because the value in real estate is in the land in many different respects so originally I just started with get the property whether it had a house on it or not the safest thing is to find something with a house on it because then you can still get rent some income straight away that's right Right. get the what is commonly known in australia as the da or the development approval even though they have slightly different names in every state and then sell the property with the da so you can build two here or three or four then as we started to get a bit more income i i uh, split the blocks i would just sell the blocks um and you make even more money then. So still keeping the same property at the front and having the three metre wide yeah. and doing the battle axe subdivision? Ideally, battle axe doesn't work that well in Adelaide. Okay. All right, yep. so battle axe, you can, you know, Sydney and Big Melbourne, no Queensland, problem. Queensland, huge yeah. in Queensland, yeah. yeah. So you so you found the property, you got the DA, and then instead of on selling those, you decide, well, I'll get the DA and then I'll do the I'll do the myself. subdivision myself. Yeah. Because, you know, selling two smaller blocks of land, you're gonna get more money than just selling that one block of land, even if it did have the DA with yep. it. Um, and then... So was that bowling over the house as well? Yep. Okay, so yep. you clear the land yep. completely. Because if the, the subdivision line goes through the house, yeah, they're not yeah. going to grant you Correct. approval until you get rid yeah. of the house. Yeah. Um, and then um, I found a great site and we were looking to in, um, accelerate our, our property portfolio. So I thought, well, why don't we build them and keep them? Mm-hmm. Because the beauty about building and keeping, which is generally what I do, I... I haven't, I've never bought to sell straight away, all right? And I keep for five years because that's the best depreciation period. The beauty about building to keep is, and I'll use some simple numbers here, all right? Because this is a radio podcast. Yes. Or oh, radio, that's an old-fashioned mate, radio. Radio. <laughs> mate, we're happy with a radio podcast. Don't worry about that's that. Right. We'll, take uh, it. So <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take all generations here, Pete. <laughs> so they could, it's not the one we have to wind up. <laughs> wireless. Yeah. wireless. So if they could visualise, so it's a $500,000 property it costs you, but it's worth six hundred, dollars mm-hmm. right? So the tenant's paying you rent based on the fact that it's a $600,000 house. But your mortgage repayment is based on the fact that it only cost you 500. So that profit is sitting in the bricks and mortar. You don't pay any GST, you don't pay any capital gains tax. Mm. So generally that's what we've done and it has worked well for us. 
I understand that like holding three or four townhouses, you're not going to get as much capital growth as, as if you had one or two period or character style homes. But the, one of the great benefits of building and keeping is it minimises your tax. And if you're in your peak earning years, 30s, 40s, 50s, that's a great way to minimise your tax. So, so can I just pick up on that? Because you on. were talking about the $500,000 property with a 600. Is that a PPOR that you were talking about? So were you moving into those places? So just explain that to me. So again. if it, generally I teach in class, you're looking for a 20% gross profit. Right. So if the thing costs you 500, it should be worth 600. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's buy on market or under market or, yep. or use the that's other. That's the development cost, right? Yep. That's, and, okay. So, so that's the, the theory is that, that you're trying to say, because I mean, I hear a lot of people say, buy under market properties. Well, right. no, the market is the market, right? Mm-hmm. And ultimately the property price is priced at that. So you argue that it's worth something that no one else is prepared to pay and you got it for a lower price. But what you're sort of saying is your return on investment, your margin needs to be at least a minimum of 20%. Yeah. So the margin on development cost, the yeah. MDC. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so the margin on all of your costs should be 20% gross profit. Mm-hmm. So the utilization of that land is what you're focusing yeah. in on to get that margin. Yeah. Okay, so that's so just for the listeners. Buying but, under market value, if I can just give you a little yeah, story yeah. here. Because I was very interested in property development, but there's not much out there to teach people how to do it. So I went back to uni and did a Masters of Urban and Regional Planning. And one thing I learnt from there, which is true for all of our development plans or whatever we call them in our different states, yep. they are all guidelines. They are not rules set in stone. If it, said you, if it says you need a minimum of 400 square metres, you still might be able to get something through if it's only 390 square metres. Or if it says it's a minimum frontage of 10 metres, you still might be able to get something through if it's only 9.5 metres. For me, like the light bulb went on. And I, sometimes I can buy properties under market value because everyone thinks you can only get two on there. But I've mm. worked out, hang on, even though we're short on this and this, if mm. I can do this, this and this, mm. they're going to give me the approval. Okay, so I want to clarify that because under market value for what is existing on that site right. isn't necessarily under market value. Yeah. It's you haven't realised the full potential of that land. Yeah. So it's like you could see a premium value more than mm. an under market value. Yeah. A classic one of that is the three metres down the sideway, right? But if it's got a brick chimney there and that chimney sticks out by yeah. half a metre and it's only a two point five metre. Uh, uh, so some people are like, oh, I can't do anything with that. I can't get the subdivision through. But if you took the chimney out, oh, you took the old fireplace yeah. out, all of a sudden your three metres yeah. is there. So you're, you saw that, but no one else did. And that's yeah. what you're doing. You're sort of saying, I'm taking a calculated investigation risk. Yeah. and risk yeah. in regards to seeing I can get three on this site. Now, the third one might be a little runt yeah. down the back of the litter, but the other two will still be. And so really, the third one is pure profit, isn't yeah. it? in terms of what you're looking at. Arguably, so, you're not taking a risk because risk is a is a measure of knowledge, right? And you just yeah. have an increased, um, an advanced, unfair advantage, in, and, if you like, in terms of the knowledge you have. And one of the ways that I minimise my risk in South Australia, as in other states, some other states, we have private certification of mm-hmm. approvals. Yep. And often I will already have my approvals before I settle. So I won't make it subject to approvals because people get scared off with that. But I've already been in contact with my town planner mm. to say, mate, will you approve this? And I'm short on frontage and area, but if I do these extra things, would you approve it? If he says yes, sign the contract. All right. Now, this is this is going into some interesting space. Cause, mm-hmm. So we, we talked a couple of weeks ago in regards to... Um, what's happening in the apartment space mm-hmm. around certifiers. So in some oh. cases they're called certifiers, yep. in some cases they're called building surveyors. Yep. And some of them are private, as yep. we know, and they can authorise that based on the guidelines of the plans. Here in Victoria, if you step one uh, inch out of the guidelines, then you would actually have to get that approved by council as opposed to a private certifier. Yeah. So there are two sets of approvals here. One is planning approval based on the plan yes. or the development plan. The other one is building rules approval. Yeah. And building rules approval goes back to the building code. So the building code are rules set in stone. If you know, if the concrete needs to have that much reinforcement, that's how much reinforcement it needs to have in it. Yeah. Unless you can come up with some other way to show that that foundation is going to be just as strong with something else in it. Yeah. Um, Whereas planning legislation yep. is different, where they, you know, where they give you guidelines on the size of the, the block and the frontage and the height and stuff like this. Um, so, so what happens if someone wants to appeal that? Because ultimately, yeah. you know, this street is only zoned for single freestanding properties. 
and then someone tries it on to get a subdivision and put a duplex on the site. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a precedence. So take us through a little bit of okay. you know, sort of that work. So working with councils, uh, I'm not allowed to swear on this, am I? <laughs> no. We'll just give us a notice so we can, so we can we're be a family show. <laughs> working with councils <laughs> is a beep <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you speak to around the country, it's the same. Totally. And one of the reasons is it's political mm. because, you know, there are some very influential people in that street that don't want the street to change. But the beauty about going to court, sounds like an oxymoron, going to court, the beauty about going to court, is, especially in South Australia, the ERD court, Environment and Resources Development yep. Court, they Look only care about the development plan. Mm. They don't care who lives in the street. If it says... In the main, we only want detached houses. Well, that says in the main. It doesn't say exclusively. So if you can show that you're not going to ruin the streetscape and you'll have similar frontages to the other houses and they'll look similar, then you'll probably get it through. But the council, because there is a lot of political pressure, they may not let it through. Mm. So look, I can see that there are some negatives about having private certifiers, especially those that mm. you know, stretch the truth or stretch mm. the boundaries. Um, so far as building is concerned, and we're seeing yep. the end result of that, especially yes. in Sydney with apartments. Yep. But you know, the ability to fast track the approval process is a godsend because in development, time is, is. money. Mm. Yep. You know, the fact that your uh, your application is in council for eighteen months compared to six months, well, there's an extra twelve months of holding cost. Mm. Plus, it's our second biggest industry construction, yeah. and it adds to supply, which means it keeps affordability yeah. a bit more in check. So, it's look, it's not perfect, and, and there's always ways in which we can improve it. Because yeah. the other thing, too, is if you've got a strong relationship with your building surveyor or, or building certifier, um, he might be a little bit more lenient for you because you know the code and you know the angles, right? Um, but what if you pay them more? That's where the, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, that, that, that's that sort of private yeah. certification. So that's the bit that we need cleaned up because as you rightly say, not in my backyard. Yeah. I mean, that is the approach <laughs> of a lot of people. I'm, like, I'm very happy to have my free sitting house there, but if you want to build in a block of apartments next to me, there is going to be uproar, yeah. right? I don't, you know, there's going to be more cars on the street and yeah. safety is an issue and you yeah. know, all of the things that yeah. we argue when we don't want it next to us. Yeah. So Peter, we've known you for many, many years and uh, one of the things that's worthy of a clarifying point for you, because you've always said land, I'm about that's house, I'm about yeah. land. But then you actually, in your own portfolio, you go and develop medium density um, townhouses typically, yeah. which, which is a slight deviation to that. But I think once you look under the covers on that, you still, you still firmly believe that the growth is in the land. But what you do personally is provide a passive income through the development process. Can you sort of so, unpack that a little bit? So not all of our properties are brand new properties that we built recently mm -hmm. and held. The, the best performing properties for us are going to be those older style homes in the inner city suburb, gentrifying inner city suburbs. That's where the capital growth is going to come from. Character charm, owner occupier appeal, best gentrified, all of, that's right. all of that high income. Low but scarce. if you have a high income, you also want to minimise your tax. So the beauty about buying and holding new stuff, you get a premium in rent and you get all that depreciation. Since depreciation rules changed a couple of years ago, mm. you can only claim a certain type of depreciation if you either actually built it or you spent the money to put in the brand new kitchen or the brand new carpet and so on. So property, uh, holding onto brand new properties is great, but not on its own. Mm. Because often, and, uh, and this has happened to me and many other people, you will sell your, in five years time, you will sell your townhouse for what it was worth five years ago. Unlike apartments, which often sell for less, because here we have a slightly bigger land component, but it's like, it's like a car. How can you expect to sell a five-year-old car for more than what it was brand new. You can't do that. Um, but in the meantime, we've minimised our tax, we've got great rent, and we move on. And, you're, and you want to retire out the debt so that you can hold them and then you have the passive income that comes yeah. from it, which is ultimately the game. Yeah. So good clarifying point. Hey, um, what we wanted to do is dive into a framework um, uh, on if someone's listening to this and they want to consider uh, whether or not development's for them. Um, bef before we go through the process, who would you say property development is for and who would you say property development is not for? Okay, so you don't, you don't want to go from zero to hero. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go from I don't know anything about property to I'm going to get into property development. You need some experience in dealing with property 
and you need some knowledge. Now, whether you get that from reading some books, and can I promote other authors here? Is that all right? I know we've got some great authors in this room, but maybe some others. So there's this Western Australian bloke called Ron Forley, F O R L W E. As soon as you said West Australian, he was a good bloke anyway. <laughs> uh, he's written three books on property development. Um, I've read them. Have you? Yep. Yeah. I think they're very simple, easy to read. They're good. Right? Uh, I've written a series of articles called Property Development 101. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 articles, you can check those out. And I've just finished a project in a beachside suburb of Adelaide called Port Nalunga South. And there's a series of videos and people can watch those as well. Uh, can we make them available in the show notes? Just yeah, link, yeah, yeah. Link to the show notes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah pellegrinoconstructions.com.au, that's the builder. And you go to videos and you'll find them. Yep, we'll and work. next year, Margaret Lomas and I are writing a book on a development that she's doing in a beachside suburb in Adelaide, and we're like documenting that and also giving some tips on what to do and what not to Terrific. do. Terrific. Nice. Or you can go to uni and go and get a... So you know, will you two come on here and talk about it as well? Oh, I'm happy to do that with Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> get Margaret back on. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret back on. I'm happy to do that. Um, or you go to, to TAFE or uni and do some sort of course. I mean, I wouldn't encourage you to do the whole degree if all you want to learn about is making money for yourself. But that's how I started the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning. I only wanted to learn about stuff for myself. And I said, I'm going to stop it as soon as I uh, do not enjoy doing this study anymore. But I finished it off, even though I started hating it when I was about three quarters of the way through my paper. It was too late to, <laughs> to stop. Yeah, so, so, uh, sound cost-wise there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too too far. <laughs> <laughs> but now, now what you've also mentioned there is that's for people who want to do it themselves. Yep. You can still outsource to professionals. So yeah. you could outsource the brief to a buyer's agent yeah. to find you the site. You can outsource the the uh, design work to the draftsman. You can outsource the town planner. You can still bring all those. So you can yep. still be a pure armchair developer. And I think that's also part of what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so you can certainly do that. So you asked me before, who's it for? It's those people that have some experience with property and some knowledge in particular of town planning. Mm. It is not for everyone. Because I'll say it up front, property development is a risky business. Mm. It does come with higher returns, but it does come with a higher risk. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, leverage. So, what's what's the first step if someone was going to do, to if they're in the four camp? Yeah. That's for them. What's the first step they should do? All right. So you've got to set your goals. All right. So and putting it simply, do you want to keep them or do you want to sell them? Because if you want to sell them, it doesn't matter where you build. You can build in really cheap suburbs. You can build in regional locations. You can build in blue chip suburbs. All you want to make sure is that you can sell it for more than what it costs you, and ideally twenty percent. But if you're going to build and keep like I'm doing, and other people do, then location is very important. You want to build and keep properties in good locations. And for me, that generally means either close to the city or close to the sea. So set your goals, number one, that'll help determine which area you are looking for and what you are going to build. If we're looking for capital growth, probably the best sorts of ha uh, properties to build would be detached houses, because on average, they sit on bigger blocks of land. Right? But if you're just looking to make some quick money, then it might be through building houses or it might be through building townhouses. Or if you've got the money and the knowledge, it might be building apartments. Hopefully no investor buys your apartment, but those who want the lifestyle <laughs> might do that. But you know, have, you, have you seen many people cross your path that have um, made money uh, through apartments who are not a huge... Not scale. Yeah, because yeah. no, you could yeah. borrow a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. building apartments is millions of dollars. You, generally, your mum and dad... Developer so did not it, have that. Like, I mean, in Adelaide, you could get away with it for, say, four to five mil. Yeah, if you were yeah. building, say, yeah. half a dozen to a dozen, yeah. depending on size. Yeah. And then it would be just a cash cow. Like, if you weren't building to sell, you were building... Because you're right, it, it would probably wouldn't do an ROI any good. You need that scale of 30 plus to sort of get yeah. your margins. So you talked about a 20%. Is that the starting point? Because I've, I've done these feasibilities before for clients, and I always try to get a 25 to 30% starting point because I know it washes down. Right. There are always overruns, right, in terms of the costs of that. Yeah. So you might wash out with a 16 or 18%, and if the market turns down, you might wash out with 10. Hardly worth it, should have just gone and set and bought a set and forget for all well, of the stress. You factor that in with your contingency though, right? Well, so, so scenario analysis is yeah. what I do. So most probably, I would make 20%. In the best case scenario, maybe 25 or 30. Yep. And in the worst case scenario, five. And the bottom line for me is, if you are still going to make money in the worst case scenario, that's a pretty good deal. Compared to a deal where... Even at five. 
Even, so if you're worst risk, case scenario, it, five. Yeah, okay. So worst case scenario. Because I'd hate to be risking two million, million bucks for five percent. That's right. right that's, that's but in my worst risk. case scenario, yeah, yeah. like Got every, it. so it's not a sensitivity analysis yep. where you know, yep. it's if everything goes bad, yep. what am I left There's with? Five on the table. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still worth my time. So that was for. So your your target is twenty. Yep. In terms of the the hold and rent. Are you even looking at that? Is it a different type of feasibility that you're doing, yeah, or you're it, still you're still looking for a? If I have to sell out of this because I you know I have a cash flow crisis or whatever, am I still doing the same type of DD due diligence yeah. and still getting that twenty? So the properties need to fund themselves. They yeah. either have to be neutrally geared or positively geared. Got it. But on the other side, I'm not building four or five townhouses, and in the end, they are worth less than what they cost me. Because yeah. in the worst case scenario, if I have to sell, I still want to make a profit. Yeah. Yep. So I need that, whatever the benchmark is, 20%, in your yep. case, it might be 25 or 30. But they've also got to fund themselves because they don't want to be negatively geared on a property that's not going to have much capital growth. Like There's yep. no point in doing that. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Got it. There's a lot of different things you've got to look so at. So the on-completion valuation, when you're trying to work out that margin, which is typically 20%, yep. sometimes more, um, We've got to be aware of some people who actually do the on completion valuation being the capital growth indexed. Uh, <laughs> it has to be. There's a trap for young players, isn't it? Has to, it? Has to, and, but there, there are people. It's going to go up 8% by the time I actually do There's people do commercially it. who okay. do that, and then do. the capital growth is actually the margin because once you do it on, on completion yeah. valuation in today's dollars, it today's wouldn't work. Today's dollar valuation. No. Nah, I, I stress to my students you need to do your numbers based on what it costs today to build and what you could buy it for today. Yep. If there is any capital growth in the future, that's a bonus. But if you developed under your scenario, looking at the future capital growth, yeah. in Melbourne or Sydney of the last three years, mate, you would have gone under. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you want to use today's sums. That is critical. I, uh, I, did a develop, well, I did a development with two friends on the Gold Coast back in 2005. It was two side-by-side -side houses just near the Tugan Airport, and we were going to build 21 two-bedroom apartments with the on-site manager, um, car park underneath, and we engaged a, um, uh, one of the best sort of project managers on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. Those days, you could get it funded. You had to put very little of your own cash in, but we did all the DD on our own dime. And long story short, we, uh, we put our DA approval into council, and what they did is they uh, just introduced a Headworks charge on all on every single um, uh, apartment which made the feasibility blow out mm -hmm. right but if we were to lodge it under the old town plan we would have been fine we had mm -hmm. the margin in with contingency we had one of the best so we thought we i, I thought oh, i had made it right <laughs> then what we did is we put the da um, uh, into council and then we realized there were shopping trolleys full of da's in council because every developer on the Gold Coast had decided that they <laughs> yeah. were trying to meet this new, this, this new levy this that was coming time. in. Yeah. And all of a sudden, so they just thought, in, so what the council did is they just went, they got their big rubber reject stamp and they rejected every single yeah, one yeah. of them, right? To work out who's actually going to come back for the second round. <laughs> right. Now we were, when you talked about before, it had a couple of investment properties under my belt. I thought I knew yeah. everything about property. And um, we had just spent 80 grand between three of us just to get it to that point. And then we had to, to make a decision if we were going to go to the mm. Land Environment Court to, because we probably would have won, but it's that, ooh, we. You've got to have the money, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> well, you're out of court yeah. here, there are lawyers involved here. Oh, yeah. here, we, here we are 14 years later, I'm a bit more confident than when I was back then. <laughs> so, so I got the I'm just like, oh my gosh. We've yeah. so, so we actually made a decision that 80 grand by yeah. three people. Let's just move on. Let's walk away. Yeah. So, yeah, and yeah. sometimes you have to do that. Mm. Um, and, and that's a good point you raise because plans do change. You know, at the time of buying, I don't know, you could put five on here. But maybe the by the time you buy it and to the time you get around to putting in an uh, application, the plan may have changed. Now, you know that if the plan's going to change because in uh, South Australia, we have something called a DPA or Development Plan Amendment. And you can find those on the council's website if they're thinking about changing anything. But um, sometimes you just have to walk away. Mm. You know, cut your losses up because it's better that than spending more money to get deeper into trouble. Well, I lost 18 months and I would have been better off during that time to actually do what I know to be true. Yeah. <laughs> but buy, to buy and hold buy is and the best way to make money in property, yeah. there is no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> it was yeah, so the owner occupier up here. But yeah. Carry it's the best way to make money, but not the only way. And, yeah. I, and I quickly learned at the time, if I want adrenaline, I'll go bungee jumping <laughs> with property. I've got to keep it simple and boring. You do. Okay, so number one, you've got to set goals. Number two. Number two, research, research, research. Right. So I mentioned before, 
we're not going to do apartments in Adelaide because apartments don't sell well in mm-hmm. Adelaide, all right? But there might be an Eastern States developer who thinks, oh, the, the Adelaide apartment market looks really good. Not many apartments there. There's a reason why there's not many apartments there. <laughs> no but they may not know that, yeah. all right? Because they may have more dollars than cents, right? So they say, yeah, we're going to go build apartments. You build the apartments, nobody comes to buy them. You're stuffed. So you need to work out what sort of property is right for that particular location. Uh, Like in a a previous episode of the Property Couch, Bryce, we talked about one of my students that's doing a development in the inner city suburb of Adelaide called Theberton. Isn't it the Barton? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) to to people outside of South Australia, that's what it's called. And yes, the council plan says you can build apartments up to six storeys. But when we did our market research, we said, no, there's no point doing apartments because Adelaide people are not interested in them. And up the road, some big time developers doing them, but he's got views over the park lands. Mm. You know, you're never gonna compete with that. So that's a sort of, that's a sort of research. The other one, even if we get down to the type of dwelling, and this is one of my uh, big points that I try and push with my students, if you're gonna build two story or more, you need at least one bedroom on the ground floor. Because if you don't have a bedroom on the ground floor, you cut out the old people market and the, you cut out the young family market. So it's working out what type of dwelling is best and then look at the design of the dwelling as well. Interesting. So can that be a quasi-studio or cinema room that can be converted to a bedroom? Because, yeah. I mean, in terms of best layout theory for me is always noise away, bedrooms away from noise and entertainment and so party downstairs, live upstairs is the classic one. And also for me is having that second landing upstairs, which mm-hmm. can be where you can have the, the games computer or whatever, or where the kids can retreat to watch their movie. Those two living zones are really important for those. What we what effectively are some sort of mini houses that mm-hmm. we call townhouses, the way in which they're constructed these days. Is there anything else that, that you would say is a must have? Yeah, you need at least a toilet downstairs. Yeah. Uh, that's critical. Ideally, double garage, mm-hmm. but generally, if you're going to have a bedroom downstairs, you probably have to sacrifice it and only have a single garage because there's only so much yep. footprint. Yep. Um, so single garage plus carport. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah, yeah. You, know, so you can still park yeah. two cars yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Off the street. Yep. Yep. Uh, look, simple things like you have 2.7 metre high ceilings on the ground floor. You should also have 2.7 metre high ceilings on the top floor. Otherwise, people recognise very quickly. I'd, so what else have they Cut scrimped on? on yeah, 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 yeah. Because you can't see behind the wall, so you don't know what sort of you know insulation yeah. is back there. Or are there two coats of paint on the wall or are there three coats of paint? And it's very dangerous being a pioneer in property development. Go and see what other developers have done. Look on CoreLogic or somewhere else and find out how long were they on the market for, how much did they sell for, do your own feasibility, did they make a profit on that one? And look at the more successful developers and just copy them. Yeah, the yeah. pioneers have got too many arrows in their back, don't they? So you make sure they can look at someone else. Going down. Number one, set your goals. Number two, research, research, research. Number three is? Find a development site. Not all properties are viable development sites. In the main, most are not. So finding a development site, either something that's already on the market or you uh, strike relations up with a number of real, local real estate agents uh, and they might give them to you, generally you have to reciprocate. So if they sell you the land off market, you need to sell through them, otherwise you're never gonna get another property (laughs) from them. So so when you're out there doing this, this is is a a very, very good trick for the rookies, right? Mm -hmm. Don't say you're gonna buy, you're gonna hold them, right? Yeah, that's right. They won't, they will not (laughs) give you, if you you need to, the first thing is, oh look, I'm looking to develop and flip. Yeah. I love that, right? They like to know how one turns into four. They're gonna get double commissions. (laughs) One commission turns into four commissions. How many do you want to put on there? Yeah, you know, at least three, and even if you settle for two. So all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, I'm gonna sell three properties here. This is a great day for me. That's the truth. I mean, you can change your mind, can't you? And I think that's, yeah, that's the point, right? But, because you won't get a site offered to you by an agent if you're telling them that you're gonna hold them, right? You just won't get it. You're just gonna be one of the other bidders for a site that's already available. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, Can people bootstrap development site research or do they have to put their hand in the pocket? And like, if I'm in Adelaide, could you find a development site without having to pay for paid resources or you could? Yep. All right, well, that's encouraging. The only (laughs) database that I pay for is my CoreLogic subscription. But, you know, now realestate.com have a fair bit of information, not as much as CoreLogic, mm. but you can find out what previous properties have sold for, right? Um, 
you can go to your local library and get the Rawlinson's Guide to find out what construction costs are. Um, but if you speak to enough builders, you get an idea per square metre. Correct. And is it $1,300? Yeah. Is it $1,400 a square metre? I always say to people, start with your volume builder yeah. and work out what their townhouse price is mm. per square metre and you've got a rough guide. Yep. And then go and validate that against the properties that they're building in a local area. Yep. And then you're halfway home, right, mm. in terms of your per yep. square metre yep. costs. No, you don't need to pay for much information as all well, at, yeah. at, at all now but you, you said you do it and you bootstrap it yourself but you have a elevated level so for our absolute beginners mm -hmm. um, is it worthwhile them getting that sort of town planner in to validate I hate you know especially hate hate them to buy a million dollar site and then find out surprise yeah. Look, yeah. You, firstly you need some knowledge so we're talking beginner they're ready for it. it's not like yeah. they don't have any investment property right yeah. so Read those books, read those articles, watch those videos, maybe go and do a short course somewhere at a TAFE or a uni. Um, and then, yes, get a team, all right? So, I mean, I'm the world's worst drawer, right? I can't even use a computer to, to draw. So I've obviously got a building designer. Sometimes I use an architect depending on, you know, how expensive Have the area is. my planes, mate? Anyway, story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> my plane drawings vary on you, you don't want to see them. <laughs> um, obviously, it... You're going to find either a property manager or a real estate agent, depending if you're going to keep them or you're going to sell them. Yep. Um, town planner is critical. Your private town planner, they're the ones that will work out whether this project is viable yep. or not. If there's only one person you're going to pay, it needs to be What's that. your tip for that? So can, can someone get the town planner on the promise that they'll give them the work or is the town planner too wise for that and they're going to go, well, I want you to actually pay me yeah. first? No, no. I, I would. You might have to pay a town planner even up front. You know, they might charge you 200 bucks an hour. Okay. It's worth it. But you need to go and find three or four town planners. I'm sure you can search on the net and look at the reviews of these town planners and find the one that you feel most comfortable with. Mm. And it's generally not the one where everyone else says you can do four and the, and the other town planner says, yeah, I'll push the boundaries and we can do six. Mm. And you start doing your feasibility on six yeah. and you only end up doing four. Yeah, you're no, in trouble. That's not good. What, are we, what have you taught us already, Pete? Be worst case scenario. That's right. Be worst case scenario when it stacks up at 20 at worst case scenario, you're good. And Because yeah. there will be others that get you down to that five, right? Mm. Number three, find a development site. Number four is? Choose the best site. Okay. So there will be a number of development sites and you might find, for example, you might find four sites, keep the numbers simple, they're all a thousand square metres and they've got a 20 metre frontage. So in theory, they're all good sites. However, one has a slope on it. No, two have a slope on it, all right? But one of them is on the low side of the road, the other one's on the high side of the road. Well, just comparing those two, assuming they're the same price, the one on the high side of the road is a much better development site because then you can get your sewerage to run down by gravity into the mains under the road. But if you buy the one that's on the low side, well, you're either going to need a pump to, to pump the sewerage back up. Some councils want one pump, some councils want two pumps, some councils say no pumps. Oh. So you could buy that as a development site, but you can't develop it because you can't get the sewerage back up. So then you're pushing it uphill. <laughs> I was going to say, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to say it, but you can. Hey, but think about it logically there too, right? The elevated site usually catches more sun yep. as opposed to what you're building down lower. And if it's on the lower side of the hill and it's covered by shade of the hillside where the aspect of the land, you're going to get mould and dampness and all of that down in the bottom site. So anything downhill site, I would not go anywhere yep. near. Obviously, the perfect side is that flat site with no flat. rock. Yep. <laughs> flat site, no rock, so we've got no retaining walls. We yes. have no cut and fill. Yep. Ideally, that's what you want to look for. And if uh, if you've got, say, 2,000 square metre sites, and one is, I mean, I'll give a ridiculous example here, one is 10 metres wide by 100 metres deep, and the other one's 20 by 50, the one with wider street frontage is better because you've got more chance of fitting multiple properties on that site. Yep. Whereas a 10 metre site, one crossover, mm. yeah. and a crossover for anyone who knows that's cr crossing over from the nature strip on. Yep. So that's the driveways, mm. right? That's what we call crossovers. The wider the blocks, you get the two crossovers on. Now there. you mentioned before, Ben, that you need to be three metres wide to put a house at the back. So from the fence line yeah. to where the dwelling finishes yeah. in Victoria, you need 15 metre frontages, yeah. and you need that three metres wide for that for that driveway. So throughout the whole state. 
Yeah, that's the state. So in the yeah. count, for us in South Australia, it's council by council. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. sometimes councils want three metres, yeah. but sometimes they want three metres plus a metre media plus a metre landscaping. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes it's three metres and a half a metre landscaping. Mm. So, and that's the added complexity in South Australia, and I'm sure that's the case in other oh, states. It'd be everywhere. Yeah. Rules, rules yeah. are different. Hence, if you're going to do it somewhere interstate, well, you, you've got, you know, very, it's a gutsy effort because it's a high risk, you can not mm. even see what's going on. But you, you've got this challenge around, the first person you've got to really employ is that town planner yeah. with the local knowledge, yeah. who's got plans and permits over the line uh, with that, council that council before. Yep. That's because you can go and speak to the town planner at council and you yeah. know, they're all lovely people, but, but they're, not there, to give you, yeah, they're um, not there to give you free property development advice. So <laughs> oh, here we go, or oh, maybe. <laughs> Like, you'll get that. You need to have oh, to decipher it. Make sure there's no other shopping trolleys in there. You know, with the DAs. All right, so number four is choose the best site. Number five is get your plans drawn up. So, like, you can tell the building designer or the architect, you design me three bedroom, two bathroom, two living areas. They'll do that. But there are some key elements of the design that you must incorporate. And unless you tell the designer, they're not going to incorporate them, right? So, bedrooms need to be at least three metres by three metres. Two bathrooms, one must be an ensuite. If it's two storey, as I said before, we should have at least one of the bedrooms downstairs. This is toilet. the. One of the toilets. Yeah, one of the toilets and downstairs. Bedrooms, and, and bedrooms. bedrooms yeah. Yeah. So, this is one of the things that that research does for you. It, it tells you, you know, what, what design your property should be based on what the highest selling townhouses have sold for and the quicker selling townhouses. You give that information to the building designer or the architect, and they'll do it. Otherwise, you give it to the architect and you tell them to build that, they'll build something that might win an award, might cost you a bloody fortune as well, but you didn't give them any other info. If you're yeah. in this for investing, <laughs> yeah. then you, you don't necessarily want the award-winning townhouse. <laughs> Maybe you can kind of sell it in five just... Well, that's why step one was set your goals. Be yeah. clear on what your agenda is, what's the strategy, which way you're headed. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So, number five is draw up your plans. Um, number six is? Crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's a scenario analysis. So you have your best case, worst case, most likely case. So in your most probable case, it's what you think will happen. In the worst case scenario, you do things like, let's drop the price. But you don't just say, oh, let's just drop the price by five or 10%. Look at CoreLogic or look at realestate.com. What has the lowest price townhouse sold for? And in your best case scenario, you look at what the highest, highest price townhouse is sold for, price, and you put those numbers in. Yeah. All right. Um, if we're looking at holding costs, and the biggest one is interest. All right. So if I go with my bank, it's this much. But if I go to the finance broker and he can't get me the money and I have to borrow it this much, how much does that hurt me? Or if, if my finance broker gets me a really good deal through this bank and I can get that rate, what's that going to look like? So you, you must be realistic. It's not just a arbitrary of 5% less than 5% more. And the other thing you'll find out if you did a sensitivity analysis is you need to work out wh which ones, which inputs am I most at risk, is, at risk with. In other words, uh, if I pay an extra half a percent interest, is that a deal breaker? Mm. Maybe not. Mm. But if my townhouse is sell for 5% less, mm. is that a deal breaker? And generally, it's the biggest inputs, which is your, con your land, your yep. construction cost, and your sale price. You really need to have... And one other, time. Yeah. Because the time you're holding that interest. So, so that's where it blows out, right, isn't it? In terms of sensitivities, it's like, okay, deterioration of value prices, bang. But that if, it's, if it's a half percent extra, delays in no building, big deal. Delay, delay, delay. Six months extra, that is a big deal. Yeah, that's a big deal. So let's get some practicalities and some takeaways. So uh, dev fees, what, what sort of software are you using for that? Or are you just break, breaking out the, 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 the Excel or the Abacus? Or what are, what are you using? Excel spreadsheet. Really? Yeah. So um, something that you developed yourself? Or, yep, yep. Okay. so something that I use in class and I yeah. show the students, because they need to be able to understand it. There are some great feasibility uh, software out there. So at Adelaide Uni where I teach the master students, we use a, quite a complicated feasibility software, but that's for people that want to build hotels and multi-storey apartments. But if you're just going to build houses or townhouses, mm -hmm. really keep it simple, Excel spreadsheet, that's all you need. Okay, very yeah. good. So uh, we're halfway there. Set your goals, number one. Number two was research. Number three was find a site. Number four was choose the best site. Number five was draw up your plans. Number six was crunch the numbers. Let's bring it home. What's number seven? Work with the council. You must understand the council has all the power. So you don't want to upset the people at the council because it's very easy 
Reject, reject, reject. What do you mean, you <laughs> blokes? You blokes don't have a clue. Sir. Seriously, you, <laughs> where did you get your qualifications out of the back of the Wheaties packet? <laughs> Unfortunately, I know that red reject stand very well. <laughs> Put that one at the bottom of the pile. Uh, oh, no, we haven't got to that one, sir. So you, from, the, from the first contact with them, on the phone or at the front counter, you know, this is what I'm proposing. What do you think? And, and maybe they will give you some tips and some clues. They don't have to, because like I said before, they're not there for free property development advice. Um, but then if you're, you know, you're as nice as you can be and you're not getting your way, right, and you think you should be able to, because the town planner, your private town planner that's working for you says this should happen, well then we might go the next step and go to court. However, I'm not sure how, work, how the court system works in other states, but in South Australia, they'll tell you you need to go to a mediation meeting first, right? So mediation meeting, there's no lawyers. So often the thought of council going to court gets them thinking, we need to be very sure that based on the development plan, we have the right decision here. And often at mediation, you can work it out. Mm -hmm. Then if you've got very deep pockets and you're still not getting the answer you want, all right, then you might employ planning lawyers and go further. But for beginning investors, mum and dad developers, Look, if you can't get past the mediation stage, mate, unless, you, unless it's a multi-million dollar project and you are very sure you're going to win, then, um, I'll, like you did, pull out. Because one thing I've learned is you go to court to get an outcome, not necessarily justice. Because mm. what you think is justice, the other person does not. Yep. Mm. Yep. My other, my, just a little tip in there quickly. Yes, please. Um, really polite calls every day. Mm-hmm. Because uh, so a couple of the developers that smart I've worked for, smart is dumb. Dumb is smart. Yeah, just yeah. just just how you're going with that. Yeah. I don't. I look. I know I'm intruding. I know you've got a busy schedule. They normally find squeak as cog gets the most oil, and you're being very polite about yeah. it. You'll normally find you you'll be able to speak. You speed should put that up. in your um, course notes before you approach council. Make sure you've read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence <laughs> People, because it will well and truly set you That's up for a very good point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing you should do is when you make contact with a town planner at council, get their name, um, because and what muffins they like. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just happened to bake. My wife just happened to bake. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sort of tried to uh, make sure that they're well fed when they're talking to you? I just hope and pray that the the town planner that picks up my application is a reasonable person. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Rather than one that's in a bad mood and says, "Look, mate, the development plan says 300 square meters. You've only got 299. Reject." Yeah. Uh, number seven was uh, work with the council. Number eight, select your builder. There are many builders out there. At the moment, things are going very bad in South Australia. We've We've had nine builders go under in the last nine months. Wow. Yeah. Now, the bottom line is it's poor management, whether it's of money or people or resources, but you need to select a, uh, a builder and not just the cheapest one. No. Again, go and get quotes from three or four, meet with them face to face, go and look at their previous projects, maybe go online and see what other people have said about them, and then pick, pick the builder that's right for you. Like. I mean, I don't know who all the top-end builders are around the country, but you don't want to pick a top-end builder if you're building in a cheap suburb mm. and vice versa, right? You don't want to pick a big volume builder that does thousands of houses a year if you're building in a prestige area. So you need to select your builder. And for me, whether it's the builder, whether it's a town planner, for me, I don't always go for the lowest price. Mm. It's who I feel most comfortable with. So so a question on that, volume builder, are you comfortable with volume builders? Yeah, yeah, if I'm building in an area yep, where fine they're fine too. with that, yep. I have no problem with yep. that. Like in the old days, you know, the AV Jennings of these yep. worlds, they would be fine. Yeah, no yep. problem at all. Yeah, yep. and, and some of the beginners, that's what we talk to them yeah. about. Like go and get it priced up with them. They even do the planning piece. Mm. So, so, and they buy bulk. So all of their materials, so you get an independent yep. builder there's potentially 30% savings, mm. but from a volume builder to a one-off private builder. Quality and all that needs to no. be managed, but that's the trade-off, right? But this is about investing. So it sounds like the biggest blind spot that people have with selecting a builder is uh, thinking price is everything. Is there any other sort of hiding in plain sights when selecting a builder that people wouldn't think about um, that you might well, be able to help Go with? and see what they've built before. Mm -hmm. What's their quality like? Mm -hmm. um, it's, and, and I do this, doesn't matter who I'm doing business with. Like if you ring somebody, and they don't return your call, why are you chasing them? 
So you're ringing them to try and give you money, to try and give them money. Yeah, exactly. And they're not returning your call. What's going to happen when there's things go wrong? Yeah. Where's the plumber that was meant to be on Tuesday, Harry? Yeah. 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 Just tip. simple business acumen. Yeah. Number eight was select a builder. Number nine, surely this has got to be straightforward, doesn't it, Pete? Number nine? Organise a finance one. <laughs> yeah. In this environment, that, oh. that's a layup, Ooh. isn't it? Nightmare. <laughs> Nightmare. But there are some third-tier lenders that are, have a very big appetite for property development at the moment. Are we allowed to mention names here? Yeah, right? yeah, sure. So I know a lot of developers in Adelaide are going for Latrobe. Mm -hmm. yep. So Latrobe has a very big appetite for property development at the moment. Some are going private. Mm -hmm. So they're going to wealthy individuals or groups um, to borrow the money. Higher interest yeah, rates. Yeah. Right, so if you're going to buy a house, a typical house, it's probably four to four and a half percent interest rate. If you're going to go to the bank to get development finance, it's probably 5.5% interest rate. But it depends. If, it's, if, if you're building three or more, many banks will consider that a commercial project. So you'll get commercial rates rather than residential home loan rates. Mm. But then you go to somebody like Latrobe, it might be 8 or 9%. And then you go to a private lender, it might be 11 12 or more percent. Mm. And so just on that point, we aren't talking about that over a 25 or a 30 year period. No. We're, we're talking about that as during the construction that phase is correct. with a view to potentially refinancing that into mainstream lending once the project's done. Because the risk is taken away then, isn't it? You, know, is. you, you don't go broke halfway through the project. Yeah. Yeah. And is there a scale based on, um, on purport, like if you're going private funding, you'd want to scale up, you'd want to be doing more so that you're getting more profit to counteract the additional oh, yeah. cost and versus like the mum and dad couldn't go private funding. Oh, on please that. don't. <laughs> Anyone listening to this, if you're a mum and dad developer, yeah. if the banks don't lend you the money, they are telling you something. Yeah, yeah. You need to wait until you find a better site or you've got more money. You know, mezzanine finance or private lender finance, that's for the experience, yep. boys and be girls. Careful, yeah. Be careful, be yeah. very, very careful. careful. Number nine, organise the finance. Number 10 is P. Project management. If you pick a volume builder or a typical builder, they're going to manage the project for you. But if you're going to be building and you live interstate, then you may want somebody else overseeing the whole project, making sure the building designer is doing the right thing and the town planner is. And... Uh, the builder, of course. I mean, like I said, the builder should manage the pro the construction, but there are a lot of other things that should happen before you even lay. So it's, it's almost the that accountability person that's yeah. the layer between the builder who's who's making sure that they're not pulling the wall over the eyes of the uneducated right. armchair developer. Yep. Yeah. Now, a rule of thumb on fees: um, one point five percent of the value of the construction. Have you got any sort of rules of thumb, fixed price? Any sort of gauge uh, on that? They vary. Some do it on end value. Some do it on construction. Yep. Um, In percentage terms? Percentage terms. Probably the value of the whole project, I wouldn't be paying more than 5 or 6%. Okay. But then you have to take out, because the builder's got a margin as yes. well. So yep. you need to take that out as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing I would say, Ben, in terms of the, uh, the development space too, is um, the reason I know that that uh, question on margin on development cost before was that the on completion valuation when it's completed or in today's dollars is because sometimes when you add a project manager in at a smaller scale, they have to do that mm -hmm. so that it looks like there is a profit. Because um, if you, because quite often the profit in the smaller scale is actually within the project management fees themselves. Yeah. So that's an important distinction to make sure when we're crunching the numbers, Today's dollars yep. mm. on completion, yep. factoring in project management. Uh, number 10 was project management, number 11 is? So, real estate agent, property manager. So, if you think you're going to keep the properties for the long term, don't look for the property manager when they're finished. Get them in early, because they'll tell you things like, well, what tenants are looking for is three bedroom places, not four bedroom places. What all tenants want are built-in robes. Um, what all tenants want is an alfresco area. Or if you're going to sell them, the real estate agent will let you know what people are looking for. So he, he or she might say things like, you must have at least a bedroom downstairs. Or a double garage is a must. If you can't do a double garage, forget about it. Now, we did a field trip with my students just a few weeks ago. And there was a group of four townhouses from the one developer, a mum and dad, well, a beginning developer, right? So he had... Cut a long story short, the two end properties sold quickest and for the highest price because they only had one neighbour, right? But the two middle ones, only, each one only had a single garage, 
Each one did not have a bedroom downstairs. He sold one for 420 with like the first open. Sold the other one for 390. The two that have been on the market, he can't sell them for 350. Because mm. he didn't get the design right. Mm. All right, so it's not, and this is my favourite movie, Kevin Costner, um, Field, Field of Dreams. Dreams. Oh, it is not come. Build It and They Will Come. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Waterworld. <Yeah. laughs> or, no, that's one of his not so good movies. But also getting them in early, Pete, you yeah. made mention of, they, it helps with the planning side, that but also the, the crunching of the numbers yes. in terms of, and what are the rents? Yeah. What, what would I attract with a property like that? Yeah. So you because a good real estate agent will say, well, see that townhouse that sold for 30,000 more? That's because the developer had a furniture package. Yeah. But you can't see that on CoreLogic or realestate.com. You yeah. don't know that they paid the extra yeah, 30000 because all the furniture went with it. Ah, mm. yes. Yeah. yeah or point. there was a cash back. You know, a number of developers would do that. You pay four thirty, and I'll give you 20000 back yeah. day one. Yeah. Yeah. CoreLogic shows four thirty. It's yeah. my beauty. Yeah. Everything sells for four thirty. But the agent will know that. Yeah. The local agents will have well, that local I love a good blind spot. I like it. I love a good one. All right, so before we go to the last one, we're going to rattle them off here. Number one was set your goals. Number two was research, research, research. Number three was find a development site. Number four was choose the best site. Number five was draw up your plans. Number six was crunch the numbers. Number seven was work with council. Eight, select a builder. Nine was organize the finance. Ten was all about project management. Eleven was about the real estate agent and the property manager. And Pete, number 12 is the taxes. You need to understand the taxes because... When you buy an established property investment and you sell it, right, you're going to have capital gains tax. Hopefully if you've made a gain, right? Same with development. If you build something and sell it and you make a profit, you'll pay capital gains tax. But the other tax that you will pay in property development, whether you make a profit or a loss, is the GST. So they don't care whether you made a loss on the whole deal. The tax man wants their GST component. Now, if you go and see an accountant before you even start, they'll tell you things like, you should register for GST. We're going to do this under something called the margin scheme. All right, you have yourself all set up and we're going to put this in, you know, this entity. You know, maybe it's in, because you, you want to sell them straight away and you're going to make a big profit. Why don't we put it in your wife's name who earns less than you? Or, or a company structure. Yeah, or a company structure. Mm. Go see your accountant first work out the structure, get to understand what taxes uh, might you might be liable for. But a lot of developers have come unstuck because they're happy to, well, not they're happy to pay the capital gains tax, but they're willing to pay the capital gains tax. But that GST... 10%, bang. That, that's being paid whether you made a profit or a loss. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So on that point, not every accountant's created equal, are they, Pete? Nah. So your, your local accountant who might be doing your typical tax return, like uh, you know a typical volume tax yeah. return provider, not the type of accountant to go and see. Yeah. Um, you may need to get a specialist referral to a, an accountant who does this type of work on a more regular basis and can give you all of the pros and cons of the different types of structures yeah. and all of the tax impacts around Certainly it. the accountant that I use in Adelaide, fantastic property specialist. But for, for those people that either don't live in Adelaide or you know live somewhere else, simple things like on the contract, I mean, I don't know all the contracts around the country, but somewhere on the contract it's going to have, is GST applicable or not? Mm. If your accountant can't answer that question, you better go find another accountant. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. Hey, final one for me uh, is if you were to, uh, we'll do a little bit of time travel here, Pete. We go back to your very first development that mm -hmm. you ever did. Mm -hmm. What advice would the current Pete give to the Peter back then on that first development that you didn't know at the time? Oh, if only all the deals were like that. Can I, can I, <laughs> yeah, can I finish up with this? Well, yeah, I'll buy it on out there, bring us yeah. in slowly, <laughs> Pete. Just so I buy a property in a seaside suburb of Adelaide called Seacliff, yeah. all right? And I get just the approval to build two, just the DA. I make 50% profit, all right? Just on the DA. Just on the DA. Next person that buys it, they sell it a year later. The bastard also made 50% profit. <laughs> <laughs> which to me is an illustration of timing the market's also important. Because the property market was going up anyway, 
we were making a profit. So I thought I was a genius making 50%, but I went <laughs> and through all that time. You 102 <laughs> years. Boys, I'm so right. tired. The buy hold strategy works. <laughs> so what would you have said to yourself? Back yourself in, stay in it a bit longer and don't give away your margins. <laughs> I mean, I know so much more now, obviously, than I did before, but you're right, mate. The best way to make money in property is to buy and hold. It's not the only way, but it's certainly the best way. Well, I think that's a good place to stop, Ben. Love it. Delivered some great gold. Well, uh, mate, we appreciate you coming on. I think um, our listeners will benefit from your wisdom, your experience, and uh, doing this in the trenches, not only for yourself, but also having to impart that onto yeah. students so that they can yeah. do it as I, well. I just so. want to stress again, property development is not easy. Mm. You know, it might, you know, we're having a laugh here mm. and a, a bit of a joke, but the reality, pro- property, de- property development, small scale residential development, let alone big mm. scale apartment development, is not easy. It looks sexy and exciting, but it can be very risky. Be careful. And, and I think, you know, if I was to close that out, there's a couple of people that, that I'm talking to and mentoring around this stuff. And I, I've said to them, look, I'm not the, the, the expert. I've got some, some base, mm-hmm. baseline knowledge and I can very much help you. But one of the things that's really clear in watching them look at you as you're telling us is the uncertainty. Why can't you give me certainty on this? Like, I think if you were ever thinking about residential property investors, like, but why can't the town plan it? No, that's possible. And tell me, it, it, is, it is just a constant wheel of uncertainty. Mm. And you're trying to mitigate risk and you, you can't because no one can give you definitive answers no. in this space. And I think if you go in there knowing that it's going to be white water on some days and it's going to clear up the next day and then more white water the next day. Stay right? out of the waves. Stay out <laughs> of the waves. That's, that's the piece here. And I, and I, I know that's frustrating because right? you want to invest in something you think mm. is, I've done my homework, I've done my due diligence, but it still can be a rough ride and no one can give you certainty. So once you get peace with that and you understand that it's high risk, high reward, then you might enter into this area. Pete, we're gonna put some uh, links in the show notes, uh, a couple of the resources that you talked about. Mm-hmm. If anyone wants to reach out to you and say good day, they can do that. But uh, mate, as always, it was a pleasure having you on the property couch and uh, keep doing the great work that you're doing at Pippa and everything you're doing locally in South Australia. And we'll see you next time when you come along and join Thanks, us on the Thanks mate, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Bryce. Mate, uh, what, what I've got to say is, um, that apart from it being a great interview, he obviously clearly knows what he's doing. Mm. How, Ivis, how much was it for us to be in the room with that much intellectual horsepower? We had the chair of Pippa and the chair of Pika going, like just throwing <laughs> throwing wisdom bombs. Um, mate, that was, I was at the front row seat. But too. also, you know, like I, there was so much I learned as well. Yeah. Like this, this is the point here. You're sitting there as a listener or jogging or riding or whatever you're doing, driving a car. And we're also, you know, there's, there's so much to learn in this space. And that's the best part. So if you think you know it all, mm-hmm. trust me, mm-hmm. you're only, you know, there's always more to learn. Yeah, always. I uh, think uh, Peter is our most uh, returned esteemed guest mm. uh, by number. So we love having the property professor on. Thanks for your time, Pete. Hopefully you got some benefit out of that. We've been on four times. That's how much we love him. We do love him. So uh, the current chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia. Uh, it was good to have you, Pete. Hey, uh, my life hack today yes. is from listener Kent Wiggins, who also gets a book. Uh, and he says, life hack, if you are hard of vision and struggle to read small labels, now, I don't want to look at anyone else in the room, Ben, but mm. one of us, well, I might be talking to one of us, so there's only three. Well, you've got okay. your glasses on, So you're already there. If you are hard of vision and struggle to read small labels, Ben, mm-hmm. take a picture with your smartphone, then zoom in on the content. I love it. <laughs> might be a good one for the Collingwood fans being one-eyed. <laughs> I didn't write that, Ben. So, so well, I think I mentioned this before. So here I was last night in bed. Not, I haven't mentioned that before. But um, <laughs> there was a 30-minute article that I needed to read, right? So I, like, How did you know it was 30 minutes? Because some, some articles say 30-minute read. This was a report. Yeah, but do, Gator, they, right? do they have a little um, footnote for Collingwood fans? It might be 40. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Bang, there's one error. Let me just get that. Out. Yeah, yeah, Ooh, yeah. Got that one. Yeah. Um, so it's 30 minutes, right? And it's in small font. So I've used what uh, what Kent was saying, and you know, two fingers widened it up. So I, but then you can't fit it all on the screen. So I'm like, oh, this is going to kill me. So you know what I did? No. I, 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 it, there's a forward button down the bottom. I forwarded it to a PDF, right? right? And then I selected it all and I hit speak. And then it speaks the whole 30-minute article to me, and I can just listen to it. 
Oh no, we might have just lifted the Collingwood Football Club's <laughs> IQ. If they get onto that, See, every now we won't and be able to rubbish and they'll finally be smart off. It's like Every now and then I just use technology oh, to solve my problems. There you go, I folks. Mean. You heard it here first. Yeah, Ben's so. IQ is just about to lift because he's now going to listen more than he's going to read. Hey, mate, did you know? Did you know, Bryce? Well, on the back of the, uh, the, the, the podcast we did a couple of weeks ago on the apartment market and the confidence mm. challenges that we're seeing in that. So there's a crisis of confidence in that marketplace. Today, in fact, all the big wigs are getting together, the federal minister and all of the state ministers and so forth. Um, and we also saw early this week, the Victorian government announce a cladding fund, a removal, a cladding removal fund, $600 million. Well, yes. there was devil in the detail there. And I just want to share that with you because this is a did you know bit. Um, it's a $600 million fund of which they're happy to put $300 million in and are hoping that the federal government can whack in $300 million of their own money. Yeah. That's interesting. Otherwise, that's a big special levy. Now, the <laughs> fact of the matter is that is a poof-tenth of what's needed in terms of to fix up this problem. Like They are kidding themselves to think that that $600 million is going to do the job. It's going to be in the billions. Um, it is a complete disaster. Just to give you an idea, there are they, were, they completed 2,227 audits mm -hmm. and they found 1,069 properties that were at risk, of which there were 72 at extreme risk and there were 409 at high risk, right? So that money is going to, they say it's going to take five years. Oh, I think it's going to take longer than that. So here's the mistakes. Were mm -hmm. the regulators asleep at the wheel? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you get a situation where you, ha you know, because who's paying? Guess what? It's you and I, the taxpayer. We've got this massive problem, and it's not just Victoria, it's Australia-wide, because there has been fundamental flaws in the way in which we organise construction in this country, and it's, and it's coming back to bite us on the bum. So, you know, whether it's the regulators who approve this stuff or whether people lied, we need to know. Now, they, the, the, uh, the Labor Party government are definitely exploring their options in regards to trying to recover some of that money from the developer or the builder. Now, good luck with that <laughs> in terms of trying to get some, but I don't mind them at least exploring that because they're the ones who have made the billions of dollars in profits and have left the unexpected consumer in a position where they trusted the system, they trusted the Australian building code, they trusted the people to do the job that they said they were gonna do, and they haven't done it. So again, we talk about quality and safety versus speed and greed. We've got a speed and greed story here. And now what's the, 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 the wash up of this is now, you know, hopefully the regulators are going to get better and there's going to be more scrutiny. Into, so this is the problem that we have when we go for speed over uh, quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's my did you know. Um, more to be said on this because we do not want, you know, it's the second biggest employer in the country. So we absolutely need to get a confidence back in the marketplace. The vast majority of apartments built in this country are built correctly, are built well. But uh, you know, when you put cladding on it that's flammable, uh, and you put people at risk, what else can the governments do? You know, they've got to put pe you know people before profits. So it just means though, because someone was you know, or people were doing the wrong thing, and the regulators weren't uh, weren't sort of enforcing anything or checking or testing. We've now got to pay for it, and that, that that that's the bit that annoys me. Sounds like Ben. That uh, if the meeting today sounds like I reckon there's a follow up. Did you know next week? Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be a digit. So. Oh, and Bryce, before we go, I've got another important did you know, and it relates to Picker, in regards to you know New South Wales. Our New South Wales members. If you're not a member, you need to be a member because this is the fight that we've got in regards to uh, changes that could be happening to the Tenancy Act now. They already did a review of this pre the election, but there is some sneaky stuff going on, right? So one of the good things that we saw in the reform package was the terminology around no grounds termination. So we've lost that in Victoria and we're gonna work very hard to try and get that back in place. So they still have that. But what they're trying to do here now is they wanna have leases for longer terms. I have no problems with that. So. They want to have long-term leases of up to five years. I think, hey, if someone wants to rent my property out for five years, that's terrific. But in terms of notification and termination, they want to basically make that less than four weeks. So it's all of a sudden like the contract's not even worth the paper that it's written on. So, um, so they're, they're calling for submissions through the fair trading New South Wales .gov.au. So if you want to learn more about it, you can basically go into the fair trading and look for uh, the New South Wales uh, tenancy reform or residential tenancy reform laws 
and they're calling for submissions before um, the 2nd of August. So they're not giving you long, right? They've opened up this little window. So we've got to work really quickly in terms of putting our putting our, uh, our submission in there. Um, also our friends, you know, from the uh, Landlords Association and those types of things are also going to be doing, doing some good work. So John's doing some good work there. But this is the sort of stuff, right? So again, we need your $5. It's really a donation, we know it is, but there's also educational content you're gonna get there or your $20 for five years. The more numbers we get, the more we can keep in you informed and the lobbying work that we can do for you. It doesn't stop, right? You know, okay, we've had an election. Um, you know, there's 2.25 million of us out there. You've got to join, guys, because it's this type of work that we need to be able to get resources for to put the submissions in and basically get these changes null and void. You, you can't have a five-year contract where one party can get out of it, you know, and not pay more than a four-week penalty. It just doesn't make sense to me. Why would we do long-term contracts? There's got Now, I'm not saying you've got to pay the rest of the contract out. I want fair and reasonable outcomes here, but... You know, the whole idea of a contract is to get a surety for both parties. Well, the, 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 the owner of the property, the person who owns the asset, is going to get a raw deal. And so these are the types of things that we're seeing happening right across all the different states and territories, and we need to stand up against it. Ben, we had someone come in uh, and talk to the buyer's agency team here earlier in the week about uh, the changes in Victoria and yep. what's proposed for the 1st of July next year. Um, what was interesting about some of that is clearly, were, you know, we're a buyer's agency team that's, um, that's advocating on behalf of investors. But uh, she said, look, um, she said, I don't see five-year leases coming into effect that often because um, if you were to engage in a tenancy with someone for the first period, if you re-engage that tenant, you are no longer able to use the clause without any reason mm -hmm. to get them out. So, so her feedback was, hey, listen, how, how are people going to game the system? What they'll do is it'll probably, it'll probably be worse for tenants. Because if you think, oh, it's just the, the greedy uh, property investor, it'll probably be worse for tenants. Because here's, here's what a landlord may choose to do, Ben. They may choose to say, after 12 months, we are going to give you notice to vacate so that we keep the right um, to, to have the option to ask you to leave. Because if they were to reinstate a second tenancy, mm. that automatically disappears. Correct. Right? Or they'll, they'll do sh shorter leases instead of longer leases. So it's actually, because I think, I think what's going on is, you know, in the bigger picture, it's to make sure no one's marginalised. And we are yep. absolute advocates of making sure no one's marginalised. But, but for the major and, and I think for the majority of the reforms, it gets rid of slumlords and all those sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, they're which regulating is for the 5% who yes. do the wrong thing. Yes. And it impacts the 95% yes. of people who do the right thing. And that thing. was... It, was, it uh, annoys the crap out of me. It was rock solid clear. So, so folks, uh, if you want to have your voice represented, um, make sure that you do join Pick Your Own. You know, if, if you're sitting on the fence and you've thought about, mm, I've thought about doing that, I just haven't got around to it. We're, we're asking you mm. to put your hand up. Non-for-profit, mm -hmm. okay, the database is sacrosanct. No one can communicate to the database. There's no selling to the database. The, the whole idea of Picker is to be able to give you this united voice that we can basically have a conversation with the regulators and the governments of the day to protect your investment. Now, what we don't want to see as you're doing is sort of having a surprise event where you might have a a really difficult tenant and you've got no recourse and if you've got that really difficult tenant you then say oh geez I should have I should have gone in with picker like because if we have the big numbers and we have influence in that conversation then it wouldn't have got to this right but it's getting to this because some of the tenancy unions and the tenancy associations claim that they have hundreds of thousands and millions of members because there's no membership fee and it's an opt-out system. So we're sitting here saying, no, we're building our membership base because people have to pay to come in. We could turn around and say, we've got 2.25 2 million members. And then, you know, well, really have you? Well, that's what they're doing. So we, we do believe that there is reform that's needed. We want to make sure that no one's marginalized. Yep. But we also, there are bad tenants. There are people who damage property. There are bad landlords, but they represent 5% of the market and we're regulating to the lowest common denominator. You shouldn't have to do that. There should be there should be middle ground there where we get the balance right. Yeah, where we saw. So Ben, very good. Did you know session, folks? Did you know any of what Ben just talked about? Let us know on Facebook. But uh, mate, busy, busy episode. We've got some real gold there with Peter. Thank, thanks to him again for coming on. And uh, until next week, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Well said. See you later, folks. 
Hey there folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.